Brother Dub certainly is no stranger to this congregation. He is a native Texan. Uh, he was born a long time ago. <laughs> but not as long as some were born a long time ago. He's a gospel preacher, son-in-law of a gospel preacher, father of a gospel preacher, grandson of an elder. And his wife, who passed away, what, a couple of years ago now, of happy memory, we may say, was the daughter of the late B.B. B. Mildred Chain, James, who, Brother B.B. B. James is a well-known gospel preacher. They have three children, and I'll pass over pretty quickly on these. We all know Andy in particular. He was he attended the schools of Burnett, Texas, and then on to uh, Freed Hardeman, and then to Abilene, when it was uh, far more of a Christian college than it ever thought about being today. And that was in 1959 when he graduated. He's done local preaching in a number of places. I wouldn't begin to list all the evangelistic work that he's done, but we've been together on a number of those. Done a lot of writing. He was the founding editor of the Gospel Journal. And as I say, he continues to preach. North Point Church of Christ in Denton, Texas is where he preaches. Keep those brethren as they labor to uphold the pure gospel of Christ in our prayers. And we're just grateful that he could be here and bring us this lesson, which is civil government and morality. I hope we'll keep in mind what we just heard and then realize how this fits so well in it. <clears throat> this is very important in this day and age in view of what's happening in this nation and the way government morality are moving along. So we want to hear you speak on this topic. Come visit with us. I'm going to begin on a sad note tonight. <clears throat> David left his timer at home. <laughs> sad for you, but joyous for... No, that doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, it's always like coming home almost to come to spring. And uh, always especially delight being with Buddy and Burnell. They keep the latch string on the outside. Some of you folks don't know what that means, but I lived in a house when I was a child that literally had a latch string on the outside. But it's a delight to be with you, and uh, I cannot think of a more relevant theme than this uh, lectureship theme for our day and time. <clears throat> if you looked at the uh, topics, you'll see that there are some topics that uh, could be very uh, sensitive in the way that they need to be dealt with, very respectful, and yet very frankly. And um, these first two lessons tonight are sort of groundwork and uh, we'll be getting into the details of some of these uh, on the morrow and then on the Lord's Day, Lord willing. But let's discuss this subject of civil government and morality. First, what is civil government? What do we mean? We might refer to it as the state, but it is a, a body politic or a body that is charged with making and enforcing the laws of its jurisdiction. This might be on a local level, such as your city officials. It might be on the state level or on the national level, but all of those fall into the category of civil government. By morality, we refer to the principles or rules by which individuals live. Now, if there is no standard of morality, then those principles are going to vary widely, of course. The word moral itself <clears throat> and its opposite, immoral, or lack of morals, have to do with the right kind of living and decisions on the one hand that would be moral, and on the other hand, the immoral things 
would have the connotation of being evil or wicked or corrupt. And this would embrace uh, such things as basic integrity, lying, stealing, theft. That would be immoral according to recognized standards of morality. It would involve such things as um, sexual behavior, of course. It would involve such things as violence perpetrated against one's fellow man and perhaps other things as well. What about civil government linked with morality? Do these subjects even relate to one another? And if so, in what ways do they relate to one another? Considering the current political and cultural climate in which we live, do these terms even belong in the same expression? Or is it an oxymoron to speak of civil government and morality? In seeking to answer such questions raised by the topic itself, we want to first look at some very basic biblical principles relating to civil government and the Christian. Principle number one, there are only two classifications or spheres of authority, and Michael touched on this. Jesus said in uh, discussing with the chief priests and the elders the matter of uh, uh, his authority, they said, uh, what authority do you have for cleansing the temple and who gave you this authority? Matthew chapter 21, verse 25, Jesus said, well, I'll ask you a question. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or from men? Now, there you have the only two possible sources of authority. It's either from God or it's not from God. And if it's not from God, it's from men. Matthew chapter 22, we see the same uh, dichotomy of authority. The question is asked, Jesus, uh, should we pay tribute to Caesar? The Herodian party was asking him that, tempting him. He said, show me a coin, a denarius. He said, whose superscription is on this coin? They said, Caesar. He said, render therefore unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. You have God's authority, you have Caesar's authority. Principle number two is God's divine authority is supreme. Since the incarnation of the second person of the Godhead, God's authority has been demonstrated through and exercised by Jesus Christ. His son. Thus in Matthew 28, 18, though he had not yet ascended unto heaven to occupy the throne at the right hand of God, it was so certain that he was going to that he could proclaim all authority hath been granted or given unto me in heaven and on earth. And we see this also in Ephesians 1 and verse 21 as Paul declared that Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And Paul then described the Lord's authority to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 15, as the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And as John began his revelation, chapter 1, verse 5, he described Jesus as the ruler of the kings of the earth. So on and on, these could be multiplied. But God exercises his authority through Christ, and that authority is supreme in heaven and on earth. Principle number three, civil authority exists through God's authority. God has thus ordained civil authority. Romans chapter 13, of course, is a textbook on this. We shall not read it, but we'll read portions of it. Verse 1 says, For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 2 and verse 21 of his book, he, God, removeth 
kings and setteth up kings. So God has ordained that there be civil authority. And uh, there are those he sets upon thrones and those that he does not set upon thrones. To Pontius Pilate, Jesus said in John 19, after Pilate said to him, Do you not know to whom you're speaking that I have the power to release you or to crucify you? And you can almost see the Lord turning and looking through Governor Pilate. You would have no authority at all except God had given it you. Romans chapter 13 again. In verse 4, in verse 6, Paul said that rulers are ministers of God, read that, servants of God, and of God's service. And then Peter echoes uh, much of what Paul says in more detail in Romans 13 when he writes in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 15. He says here to summarize that kings and governors, when functioning properly, fulfill the will of God. Now, we dare not conclude that because of Daniel's statement, God sets kings upon thrones and takes kings off of thrones, that every time a ruler occupies a throne, God has personally and pointedly put that ruler there. No, it simply means that he has the right to, and it simply means that those who occupy those positions are occupying a place in civil government overall, which he has ordained. Obviously, there have been many, many rulers on thrones that God did not place there. Those that he doesn't personally exalt, though, he nonetheless allows to rule as action, uh, acts of civil government. Principle number four, man's, that is the Christian's relationship to civil government, government and authority is one of submission and obedience. Romans 13 begins with this statement, let every soul be subject or in subjection to the powers that be. And then he says, for the powers that be are ordained of God. In verse 2, then, he says, to resist the powers that be is to resist God. Peter chimes in, 1 Peter 2.13, be subject to rulers, to authorities. I'm sorry, I skipped a line. Be subject to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Then we back up to Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. Be in subjection to rulers, to authorities, and be obedient. And though the idea of submission is not in this passage, the connection between a Christian and civil government is certainly there. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. Pray for all men, for kings, and for all that are in high place. God's ideal will for civil authorities, generally speaking, is that they maintain public peace and prevent chaos and anarchy and lawlessness, making civilization of mankind possible. Do we not see this in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 2? We're to pray for kings and those in high places. Why? That we might lead a tranquil and quiet life. That's what those men or people in places of civil authority are to guarantee for the public over whom or which they rule. But more specifically and ideally, the civil government is to reward and or protect those who abide by the law. Romans 13, 3, do that which is good and thou shall have praise from the same, that is, the powers that be, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. A responsibility specifically of civil authorities is to protect the innocent and reward those who are lawful in their lives. Titus 3 and verse 1, mentioned a moment ago, 
in the context of being subject to rulers, Paul says, be ready unto every good work. Now, this is sometimes pulled out of that context and applied to the Christian generally. We're to be about the good work that the Lord has called us to do. Well, the Bible teaches that for sure, but this is talking about good work as it applies to those to whom we're to be subject. There are laws that are good, and they produce good work when we obey them. I think that is what Paul is saying in this passage. 1 Peter 2.13, rulers are sent for praise to them that do well. So you see it again. A specific responsibility of civil law or civil government is to reward and protect those who obey the law. The other side of that coin is just as specific in God's Word. Specifically and ideally, rulers are to stop and punish evildoers or lawbreakers. Romans 13, verses 3 and 4. Rulers are not a terror. Notice this is ideally. <laughs> rulers are not a terror to the good work, but to the evil. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, an avenger for wrath to him that doeth evil. Bearing the sword in vain is a reference to capital punishment, and it cannot be a reference to anything else. Amen. And then uh, 1 Peter 2.13 says, Rulers are sent for vengeance on evildoers. So there you have rewarding those who obey the law and do good work and punishing those who are lawbreakers and evildoers. Now, in light of these passages, the question occurs, can a Christian, while living in this world, ever refuse to obey the law with the Lord's approval? Well, I suggest that not only can he, but times he must in order to be pleasing to God. This is commonly called civil disobedience because it is disobedience to civil law. We have numerous examples of it in God's Word. Moses resisted Pharaoh's refusal to allow the Israelites to go, didn't he? He was disobeying the law and drew it out through the ten plagues. David fled and hid from Saul. Here you have a protracted civil disobedience because he was a fugitive. All of the while, he was fleeing from Saul. And what about the three companions of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Nebuchadnezzar said, bow down to my colossal idol or the fiery furnace. They said, we will not bow down. That was civil disobedience. They would have disobeyed God had they obeyed the law. Can we doubt that God approved of their disobedience to Nebuchadnezzar? Daniel was forbidden by law to pray, but he continued to pray openly so that his enemies could see it and report it, and he knew what was coming. He disobeyed the law with God's approval. The Magi defied King Herod when Herod said, when you found this baby, you come back and tell me where he is so that I can pay him homage. They disobeyed the ordinance of Herod the king and went back another way. Peter's defiance of the Sanhedrin stated the prevailing principle in all such cases where civil law and divine law are at loggerheads. Jesus commanded them to preach the gospel, beginning in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world. That's another version of the Great Commission, actually. It's Acts 1, verse 8. But here they are in Acts chapter 5, and the Sanhedrin says, we straightly charged you not to preach anymore about this man, Jesus. 
And Peter's response in verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. And that must be the Christian's response any time the laws of men, the authority of man, the civil government of man clashes with the law of God. The obligation to submit to civil government is thus qualified by harmony of its laws with God's law. The scriptures clearly imply obligation that civil government has to make decisions that distinguish between good and evil. Good and evil as defined by God. And then to issue rewards and punishments accordingly. We have seen that in the expressions we have noted. The terms good and good work and do well that are to be rewarded by civil authorities. And evil and evil work and evil doers in these foregoing passages relative to rulers and their punishment of such behavior. Those terms demand the conclusion that there is an obligation of civil government to operate on a moral basis and to enforce moral principles. Well, uh, we have numerous examples of civil rulers who did not do that. Civil government does not exist apart from the persons who are in power. Thus, it inevitably reflects the morality or immorality of the individuals who have the levers of power in their hands. Think about Pharaoh. He tells the midwives to kill all of those baby Hebrew boys. That's the immorality, not just of civil government, but of Pharaoh. Think about Herod, when he, in his wrath, did not receive where the Magi had found the baby Jesus. And so he took matters into his own hands and slew, we know not how many, baby boys in and around Bethlehem. Think about the chief priests and the scribes and the Sanhedrin who put Jesus through the false Jewish trials and then took him to Pontius Pilate and demanded his crucifixion. You have men in places of power and the morality or immorality of those men comes through in the way that they're behaving, whether it's a Pharaoh or a Herod or the Sanhedrin or then Pontius Pilate who said, I find no fault in this man but crucify him anyway. But in more modern times, think of Adolf Hitler. Michael mentioned him. It was his morality or immorality by Bible standard that caused him to operate the horrendous regime that was his that took the lives of the millions. And there was Hirohito, his companion in crime as the emperor of Japan and the unspeakable cruelties that the people of his empire visited in years leading up to World War II and then during World War II. His morality could not keep from coming through his domain and his civil governing. And there was Joseph Stalin and there was Chairman Mayo, the millions that they put to death as they were in places of great civil authority. And in our own times, we have the leaders of Islam and of uh, the Muslims in many ways doing uh, unimaginable atrocities. It's the immorality of those people that's coming through. And I think it well demonstrates the utter folly of men's following subjective ideas in morality. To them, what they are doing is doubtless moral. Now, I'm not excusing them like uh, some well-known persons have done in the last few days by saying they have grievances and we ought to respond to those grievances. I'm simply saying that in their minds, their twisted minds, their perverted minds, what they're doing is moral. But 
We know that it is just the opposite. But their morality is coming through in the things that they are telling those under their power to do. Our nation's crisis of morality demonstrates the moral failures of political leaders. Apparently, millions of American voters no longer connect civil government and morality. Else they would not have uh, voted into office some of the men and women they have placed in positions of power who are absolutely devoid of moral scruples. It seems that there is an unending report of corrupt leaders in both parties, but predominantly in one. These range everywhere from outright lies and deception to the public, to acceptance of bribery, to power mongering that's almost unimaginable, to sexual immorality, and the list goes on. Besides shameless personal behavior, of which a former president still remains the poster boy, legislation, presidential executive orders, court judgments, and bureaucratic regulations that threaten to strangle us involve immoralities. Let's just list a few of these. I well remember as a young preacher in the early 1960s when the first state or two voted in no-fault divorce. Until that time, and that caught on, of course, and by the 1970s it was practically universal. Until that time, one must, uh, who wanted a divorce almost had to have an accusation and proof of adultery in his spouse or her spouse. Well, no-fault divorce came along, and uh, for no reason at all, one could go to the courthouse and uh, file a divorce against his spouse or her spouse. This, of course, helped destroy the biblical foundation of marriage and the family and contributed to the sexual revolution that really caught on in the mid-'60s and then burgeoned from there. In the late 1960s, the courts began to overturn obscenity and pornography laws and greatly accelerated the sexual revolution. And this was a major hammer blow to biblical marriage and family. I can remember in uh, the mid-60s when disc jockeys would start playing some records that had, I guess today they would be almost innocent, but they were explicit lyrics in them for those days. And I called uh, more than one radio station right after one of those songs was played and talked to the DJ, and I said, do you realize what's being said in the lyrics of these songs? And he said, yeah, I realize it, but said, I've got to play them anyway. Our one would say, yeah, but what difference does it make? But things were being relaxed, you see. The limits were being pulled back. And it was becoming a free-for-all. Say anything, expose anything, and make it all public. In 1973, Roe v. Wade was uh, the decision of the Supreme Court that allowed a woman to get an abortion for the baby in the womb. Since that time, I think it is 56 million now babies have been slain that did not see the light of day. This was a further attack on marriage. It provided an after-the-fact means of birth control. Until 1960, every state had anti-sodomite laws. It was a felony to be convicted of sodomy. And homosexuals were rightly described legally as deviants and also rightly viewed by the vast majority of the American people 
as engaging in sinful, disgusting, and unnatural behavior, as the Bible calls it. When I was a child growing up, these things were too shameful even to discuss. If they were discussed at all, it was by adults, and it was in whispered tones. And the term for those who were involved in these activities was far more appropriate than the term that they have chosen as a euphemism, the term gay. That was the term queer. And that was rightly chosen because it was queer, it was odd, it was weird, it was unnatural, it was unseemly behavior. It was aside from the norm, and so it fit well. In 1998, a court challenge led by a Houston sodomite eventually led to the 2003 Supreme Court decision which basically decriminalized homosexuality nationwide. And that threw the doors open. That ruling greatly emboldened the homosexual community, and it began making demands, and more and more demands, and increased demands. And it began putting uh, financial pressures on corporations, and it began destroying businesses, small businesses in a lot of cases. I'm sure you've read some of the cases in the last two or three years where a wedding photographer in New Mexico was sued by a homosexual couple because the photographer refused to take the wedding pictures and the homosexuals won. And then there was a case uh, up in the Northeast, I think maybe it was uh, Connecticut, somewhere up in there, where there was a family-owned business. They had a farm and they had a wedding chapel out there where people could come out in a very picturesque countryside and have their wedding, and homosexuals wanted to be married there, and the proprietors refused, politely, but they refused. They were sued, and they lost the suit. They can no longer have weddings on their farm. The most recent one, I think, is in the Northwest, Oregon or Washington, where a home-owned bakery refused to bake a wedding cake for two homosexuals who were going to get married, married. And she was sued, and uh, she's going to have to pay a terrible fine. All of these relate to our topic right now of civil government and what it either allows, endorses, or promotes, and morality. The White House resident's announcement in 2011 of his, the fact that his Justice Department would not defend the Defense of Marriage Act, that is, that marriage is between a man and a woman, which had been passed by Congress, was simply another step in the direction of immorality pertaining to civil government. Of course, the act was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, so the court got involved in 2013. The White House resident expressed his favor of homosexual marriages in 2012. Since then, judges in over 30 states have ruled against the state laws forbidding homosexual marriages. And we've had our first one in Texas just this past week, if you kept up with the uh, news. Late last year, your lesbian mayor of Houston subpoenaed sermons and correspondence of several preachers whom she suspected of opposing her homosexual agenda. And this is just the beginning, as many of you know who keep up with these things. All of these are random samples, and hundreds of others could be supplied. They manifest that the men and women in control of the powers in our nation today are without 
morals as the Bible defines them. Through them, civil government is making decisions that directly affect the morality of our nation. No form of civil government of any form, whether it's a dictatorship or democracy or whatever it is, can ever rise above the morals of those who are in power. And our founding fathers knew that. They understood that. They were men of morality, and when they used the term morality, they had one source of morality in mind. It was that morality comes from God and not from men. And we know what that is because he's stated it in his word. I want to quote just three or four of these just to give you the flavor of it. George Washington used to be taught in our public schools, I don't know if he still is or not, as the father of our nation. He said, religion and morality are the essential pillars of civil society. John Adams succeeded George Washington as our second president, signer of the Declaration of Independence and of the Bill of Rights, expressed in a speech given to a military assembly in 1798 and warned as follows. We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. When we have immoral people at the head of our government, it will not be the government that was based upon our Constitution. Ben Franklin, who also signed the Declaration of Independence and is a well-known name among the founders, said only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. The more we don't control ourselves, the more we invite others to control us. That's where we are today in our nation, I fear. Noah Webster's name is associated with his dictionary. He was the first to write a dictionary of American English. But he was also a very influential patriot. He was a teenager when the Declaration of Independence was signed, 18 years old, I believe. He's sometimes called the forgotten founding father. Here's what he said. The moral principles and precepts contained in the scriptures ought to form the basis of all our civil constitutions and laws. All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. Isn't it absolute folly for people today to say that our founding fathers did not have any appreciation of the Bible and were not influenced by the Bible when they wrote our Constitution. When that list of ten amendments we called our, our call our Bill of Rights was set down that they, well, there was nothing in the Bible that influenced them. We don't have any record that they believed in God. Evidence does not matter to such people. These men with one mind understood what Solomon wrote in Proverbs 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach unto any people. I believe that all of the immorality that we see in those in places of power and We've seen not only trickle-down economics, we've seen trickle-down immorality in our nation. But that all of this centers around one 
philosophy, and that is the philosophy of atheistic secular humanism, where man is his own God and nothing exists, no life exists that is superior to God. I wrote the following over a decade ago. I believe it's still out. I am a threat that is even more sinister and dangerous to mankind than global military terrorism. I do not grab dramatic headlines by attacking skyscrapers with hijacked airplanes or crowds with car bombs, causing immediate physical injury or death. The grave danger I represent lies partly in the fact that most people do not recognize me for the threat that I pose. I employ cultural and ethical terrorism. I subtly attack the spirits and minds of men, undermining and eroding the very cultural and moral foundations upon which sane and civilized lives are built. My weapons of war are demonic ideas that urge the unfettered pursuit and fulfillment of every fleshly desire. I elevate man and his human nature to absolute supremacy and encourage each person to formulate his own moral standards. I corrupt, rot, damn the lives and souls of men. I foment anarchy and destroy civilization. I am humanism. I believe that's what has our nation by the throat today. It is humanism run amok. I believe the powers that be in our federal government, some of our state governments, some of our local governments, are and have for some years been humanistic zealots, well exemplified by the unjust judge of Luke chapter 18, verse 2, who said of himself even, he feared not God and regarded not man. <laughs> That's about where we are with millions of people in our nation. They fear not God and they have no regard for their fellow man. It's what's in it for me. That's humanism. It's selfishness. I've long challenged people to name one sin that is not based in selfishness. The only exceptions that I've ever thought of myself are sins of ignorance. We just didn't know better. We didn't do it out of selfishness. But you name any other sin and you're going to find self at its root. And that's another way of describing humanism. What recommendations can be offered as we see the cultural rot around us? As we see our nation crumbling from what it was just a few decades ago? We need to pray, of course, as uh, Paul said, for our rulers, for those in high places. We need to pray that many of them will be replaced, for one thing. We need to pray that people in our nation can be awakened to examine the moral characteristics of those for whom they vote when they go into the polling place, instead of blindly pulling a lever for a party. We need to submit to civil government in every way that does not violate God's word. At the same time, we need to steel ourselves to resist every law that would cause us to violate God's Word, whether it's preachers declaring the Word of God from the pulpit, whether it is someone who is on the job and a moral compromise is demanded of them, or they are not allowed to speak freely what their convictions are whether it is an entire congregation that has a lawsuit filed against it because it dared teach the truth on some politically incorrect subject, 
whatever it might be. We need to steel ourselves to say with Peter before the Sanhedrin, we must obey God rather than men. Do we not know that Peter understood what the consequences might be for his making that statement and taking that stand? Oh, yes, he knew. But he was willing to suffer whatever might come. And that's what we must be willing to do. I don't know what will happen in the next few years. I do not have all that many years left by the normal span of life. You all may joke about it if you wish, and that's okay. But I know, I see every day that in my hourglass, the sand is very, very slight up there in the top bowl. It's getting bigger and bigger in that bottom bowl all the time. But unless we see a moral revival of some kind in our nation, it cannot be the nation that those who are 50 years old and older once knew. And that these precious young people will never know because it will have become so depraved it will not be that shining city set on a hill. It will not be the moral compass for all of the rest of the world. It will not be that great big-hearted nation that always is the first to respond to any national catastrophe, even among enemy nations. It will not be a nation that sends its young men to shed their blood on foreign soil, to protect freedom for all the world. It will not be a nation that rebuilds the very nations that it had to bomb in order to preserve that freedom. We will have lost all of those things. But in losing those things, we will have lost that First Amendment right to speak freely and to freely engage in the religion of our Lord. doesn't mean the church won't exist, but it means it may be driven underground. It means we may have to find our own catacombs. It may mean we have to take up our worship assemblies out in the woods somewhere. But we will not be the first generation that's had to do that if we do. We don't want that to happen. We do not look forward to that happening. But brethren, let us live in reality. That is the direction our nation is moving. With the censorship that's growing called political correctness, with the professors in our universities who are constantly feeding the young minds that are in their classes, everything that is contrary to righteousness and truth and our constitutional government, the odds are against us. Unless in God's providence, men and women of character can be put into places of power by the ballot box that will reverse some of these terrible immoral directions and bring us back to some moral sanity. Let's hope, but let's pray, brethren, that that will come to pass. Get your songbooks out, please, and turn to the song that's been selected for our song of invitation. In uh, Buddy's prayer tonight, he thanked God for the great gift of our Lord and Savior, and that's the theme of this good song. It's a reminder to us that he gave all for us. Why should we think it strange that he asks us to give for him? Give even our lives for him. He said to the apostles in the upper room, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. 
He was talking just to friends there. But if it's such great love to lay down life for friends, what love is it to lay down life for enemies? And that's the measure of his love. He loved all mankind when no mankind loved him. He asks us to give our lives for him. He asks the sinner off of the street to give his life. Because Christ gave his life. He asked the king upon his throne. He asked the wife at the kitchen sink. He asked all men everywhere, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'm going to give my life for you. And then he did give his life. Is it so much for him to ask us to give our lives for him? Oh, we're to give our lives as a living sacrifice as long as we live, but Lord, surely you don't mean that I should die for you. (laughs) Yes, he means even that too. Revelation 2.10 is another of those passages that's often quoted at funerals and misapplied. Where the Lord says to this church, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee the crown of life. That's in a setting of persecution. They're being thrown into prison for a few days. The devil being their adversary. But he said, even if you have to die for me, you be faithful. So brethren, let's live day by day in this good fight of the faith. Let's live like we know the Lord wants us to live because he's told us in his word. Let's be that light to the world. Let's put that lamp up where people can see it instead of hiding it under a bushel. He wants it to give light to all the house. Matthew 5, 14, 15, 16. Because we are the light of the world. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Notice the nuance here. He didn't say shine your light. He said let your light shine. Unfortunately, a lot of people are light shiners because they are shining their light. They are tooting their horns. No, let's humbly serve the Lord and let that light of righteousness and truth and godliness, God's morality shine where we work, where we go to school, where we play, whatever our circle of influence is. I wonder if there are those here tonight who are ready to give their lives to Christ in gospel obedience. Jesus summarized his plan of salvation in Mark 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Of course, in supplementary passages, we learn that We must repent of our sins. This is what Peter told the believing Jews on Pentecost when they said, What shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Under the remission of your sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When about 3,000 of them did that day, the Lord added them to his church. They became his people. They had their sins washed away in the blood of Christ when they were baptized in the waters of baptism. And they became his people with the hope of heaven in their hearts. They were no longer those strangers to the covenant of promise. They were no longer those without hope and without God in this world, Ephesians 2.12. They were redeemed people. They were God's people. And he sends them all out into the world to shine the light of the gospel for him. Would there be one tonight who would come and confess the sweet name of Jesus? And say, I'm turning from all other ways to walk in the way of Christ. I know he'll lead me to the Father. I'm ready to be baptized into Christ because I believe that he is the Son of God. Oh, how we'd thrill and the angels in heaven would echo our thrill. 
to witness that tonight and to help you with your salvation and your way to heaven. Are there those here tonight who have let immorality maybe slip into their lives? They've let this world tarnish them. They're no longer that light to the world that they once were and that they need to be. Would you come back to him tonight? Let's stand as we sing together.